Hi there. Let's talk about uh, the second scene of Act 1 of Hamlet. Uh, this scene begins with a gigantic speech, which is what most people hate about Hamlet, um, or about any Shakespeare play, is these long speeches in which you're like, I'm so bored, nothing's happening. But I would encourage you to have a different attitude about it because uh, it is a boring political speech at the beginning, but it's kind of fascinating when you see what it's actually doing rhetorically. So although that, uh, that takes up the majority of the scene, I don't want it to be uh, too much of an obstacle to you enjoying all the action that happens after that. Um, but Act 1, Scene 2 is basically Claudius establishing his reign. It's very much the beginning of a new era in Denmark. Hamlet's father is dead. There's a new king in town. Um, and it happens to be uh, the prior king's brother, and that's a little iffy, but that's what we're going to talk about. Some of the major points we're going to make today is that we're going to look at that long speech, um, at least a little bit. It is a brilliant politician's speech. Um, after the speech is over, um, we're going to deal with some of the, the things that Claudius deals with. He deals with a, a character named Laertes and his father Polonius, and then he turns to Hamlet. We're going to talk about Hamlet's character. It's very important to get that established, what is Hamlet like. Um, and we're going to see how Claudius deals with his nephew, his stepson nephew, as I call him. Um, and there's this new family that's been created since Hamlet's lost his father and his mother is already remarried. There's kind of a new family unit. We're going to see how that unit's working out. Um, we're going to look at the first of Hamlet's four soliloquies. Every Shakespeare play has five acts, and there's a big soliloquy in all four of the first acts of Hamlet. And then in Act 5, there's no soliloquy. And we're going to talk about um, what Hamlet does in every one of those soliloquies and why it's missing from Act 5. Um, and of course, what we saw at the end of scene one was that Horatio was going to go tell Hamlet about seeing his father's ghost, or at least what they think is his father's ghost, on the castle battlements. And we're going to get to see Hamlet and Horatio, these good buddies, reunite with each other um, and see Hamlet's reaction to the news of his father's ghost. So, um, not a boring scene at all. Actually, with a few exceptions, there's not really that many boring moments in Hamlet. So. Um, let's talk about that first speech. Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green. That's how the speech begins. Um, I want you to know that when we read this play, Claudius and Hamlet are going to be antagonists, and so they need to be in some ways equivalent, although Claudius is older and more powerful, and so we have an underdog that's sort of fighting. That's another thing that keeps us interested in the play. But both of them are very, very good at using language. In this scene, Claudius is going to be superior to Hamlet in terms of language, although Hamlet's not going to be bad. Um, Claudius is at the height of his power, and his language is masterful. He is in complete control of Denmark. That's why this speech can be quote-unquote boring, is it's got long and jammed lines, sometimes a 14-line sentence, because Claudius is in absolute control of his grammar and syntax and has this very polished speech. Um, so people think of this as a Shakespearean speech because it's difficult to understand, but it really is heightened political language. Not all Shakespeare characters speak Shakespearean, so to speak. They all um, have different tones. It's really just a superb, formal public speech. So it's, it's kind of interesting to watch all the different moves that um, Claudius does here. If I could sum them up for you real quick. He says, we're really sad about my brother's death, so he tips his hat to the previous reign. But we got to think about ourselves. So I'm the new king, and I kind of have connected my reign to the previous king by marrying my former sister-in-law, which all of you approve. And now we're going to start a new day in Denmark. And we've got to start right now because we've got a threat, external threats. Fortinbras is invading, so he's going to handle that, the international threat. Then we have domestic issues, internal things. I'm going to deal with a young man named Laertes, who's a member of my court. And I'm going to deal with my new stepson, former nephew, Hamlet. So he moves through all those things very quickly, um, depending on the actor's performance. So um, he first starts by saying, uh, you know, we're sad about my brother's death. You know, this is the proper, appropriate thing to do. Um, but he says, you know, even though the memory of my brother's death be green, it, we have to think about ourselves. We have to move on. Um, especially since we have an international threat. So, therefore, our sometimes sister, now our queen, have we taken to wife. And he usually takes Gertrude's hand. And sometimes Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, is wearing a wedding dress in the scene to sort of show us how quickly things are moving. Um, and so after he has married Gertrude, so to speak, 
He says, now follows that you know, young Fortinbras, you know, is pestering us with message about getting those lands back that his father's lost. He usually has a prop. He usually has the letters that Fortinbras has brought him. And sometimes he'll rip them up in front of the court to show how strong he is. Now, Hamlet's father, Hamlet Sr., the previous king, killed Fortinbras Jr.'s father, Fortinbras Sr. And so we see that uh, the previous king was a warrior, but Claudius is a politician. He's very good with language, cunning, manipulative, oily, if you want to go that far. Definitely, I suppose, eventually corrupt. But um, he does not handle Fortinbras with like a war. He doesn't start a war, even though they're preparing for defense mechanisms, um, building those ships and everything. Instead, he sends two ambassadors, Cornelius and Voltamon, to go handle that. So he's going to try to solve this with words. And the way he's going to handle it is he's going to sort of put Fortinbras in his plate. Place. We learn that the present king of, De of Norway is, is not given a name. His name is Old Norway in the play. He's impotent and bedridden, um, meaning he's an old man who can't really fight. And he does not know that Fortinbras has been stealing his soldiers and trying to start a war with Denmark. So basically, Claudius is going to be a tattletale. I'm going to send my ambassadors, Cornelius and Voltamon, to Old Norway and inform him of his nephew's purposes and we'll see if we can get it straightened out there. Um, so Claudius is showing he's strong and that he's handling this political threat and that he's on top of taking care of the country. It's establishing his reign. So he handles the international threat um, and looks strong, you know, even if it's not war, but it's diplomacy and most people would prefer diplomatic solutions to war. Most people would. Um, he turns from the international things on the outside and he turns internal. Um, he's got two young men and uh, they're college students, right? There's Laertes, the son of Polonius, who's the prime minister, is what I call him, of Denmark, the number one servant to the king. Um, and then there's Hamlet, uh, his uh, stepson slash nephew. Laertes is a college student in Paris. And we'll talk more about what that means, you know, what that suggests about his character in scene three. And Hamlet is a student in Germany, in the city of Wittenberg or Wittenberg. Um, just by saying that Hamlet is a student in Germany, sort of shows us that Hamlet is probably tremendously intellectual, tremendously rational, scientific, philosophical, you know, sort of hard-edged German stuff. Paris stuff sort of implies a little bit of playboyness to Laertes. So two different types of young men, and they're going to be very important major characters for him. So the first thing that Claudius does in handling the domestic issue is he turns to Laertes and says, Laertes, what is it that you were asking me? You know, and he's doing this in front of the court to sort of show that he's a good king. And Laertes says, well, I came home for the funeral, and I came home for your coronation, but I'd like to go back to Paris. Claudius, you know, defaults to his father, shows that he's not a tyrannical king, and says, what says Polonius about this, you know, request that you have? And Polonius says, he hath wrung from me, my lord, my slow leave, and I pray you let him go. And so Claudius lets him go. It's a yes answer, and sort of positive, and a good interaction with one of his subjects. And then he turns to Hamlet. Um, and this is the more difficult issue, right? Um, is because Hamlet wants to go back to Germany. He just let Laertes go back to Paris. But the answer for Hamlet is going to be no. And there's several reasons that might be happening as we go through it. So um, you could portray Claudius a lot of different ways. One of the things we want to do when we read this play is to realize that Shakespeare's plays are, you know, they're kind of dry on the page, I suppose. They only come to life in performance. And it just depends on the director for how, um, and the actor for how they want to be. Claudius can be portrayed as callous, shallow, greedy, lustful, villainous, brother-murdering drunkard. He can be all those things. He can be the worst guy you ever imagined. But he also can be portrayed as a basically good man, trying to be a good king, who did one terrible act, but is trying to make up for it. Now, we don't know at this point in the play if he actually is guilty of, of murdering his brother. Um, all this is sort of being delayed by Shakespeare, so that there's a bunch of questions in our mind. Um, he's not going to allow Hamlet to go back to Germany, um, and he could be manipulating Hamlet um, and not allowing him to go back for good reasons or bad reasons. The good reasons would be, I really want to have a new family, I really want you to love me, I love you, and we're just going to be happy even though your father just died. I'm going to make up for that. Um, or it could be what I call the gangster reading of Claudius, where it's like you keep your friends close, Keep your enemies closer. He knows Hamlet is a threat. 
Um, Hamlet is a threat simply because he was the son of the previous king. He looks like the right heir. And as long as Hamlet's alive, Claudius' reign is a little bit in question if Hamlet wants to cause a problem for him. So maybe if I keep him here, it'll prevent Hamlet from getting an army, going to Germany, getting riled up, realizing the crown has been stolen from me, and then Hamlet comes back with an army to fight Claudius, and Claudius has a real problem. So maybe if I just trap him in the castle of Elsinore and don't allow him to get an army, maybe that's how I can defang the snake. Um, if we read this speech carefully, you'll see that he calls Hamlet son and father repeatedly, and this can be noxious and disgusting, as it is to Hamlet, who doesn't think of Claudius that way, or it can just show us that Claudius is trying really hard. Um, and Gertrude's in the middle, right? She's trying to bring these two men in her life that she loves together. So he's the problem child, Hamlet is. Laertes was allowed to go back so that Claudius looked good, and it was a setup so that Claudius could say no and still look like a good guy. Um, it's fun when you read this scene to realize Hamlet is present the entire scene, all the way up to his first line, but where is he? A lot of times he's in black in the back corner, um, or sometimes hidden on the stage, and it, it's very, very funny to see how everybody is celebrating there's a new king in town, which means new jobs, new money, I want to be on his good side. It's just like when there's a new boss in the corporation, you want to make sure you curry favor with him. Um, but Hamlet is wearing black, and everybody else is dressed sort of brightly, because it's kind of a celebratory day of a new day in Denmark. Um, and Hamlet's mother refers to it as his knighted cloak, his knighted color, an inky cloak. And we learned in Hamlet's first soliloquy that Hamlet is super depressed to the point of suicide. I mean, this play begins with Hamlet wanting to kill himself. His first line in his soliloquy is, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt and thaw and resolve itself into a dew. I just want my flesh to melt away. Um, so he's, he's in a bad place right from the start. Um, and as I said, he's, he's a problem because he seems like he's the heir to the throne. Um, we're not even sure when we read the play, depends on the production, if Hamlet made it back in time for his father's funeral, because of course, bodies were buried quite quickly back then, and if he was in Germany, it's a several week journey to get back to um, Denmark. I like to imagine that Hamlet got on the shore, his father was buried, Claudius was at the crown, and he just gets back there in time for the official announcement of everything. But Hamlet's just not playing the game. He's not joining the Claudius train, as I like to say. He's not moving on and he's not seeing the new day arising in Denmark. His first lines, you know, um, not so, my lord, I'm too much in this, a little more than kill, a little more than kin and less than kind. Um, there are sharp, bitter, witty, and angry lines, right? You know, it opens with, how does my cousin Hamlet and my son, a little more than kin and less than kind, I am more related to you than is natural. The word kind means natural there. And he's punning on kin and kind. Um, I don't like being your stepson, nephew, at the same moment. Something's incestuous about that. It's more like sneakily implied, sarcastically suggested, and that is very much Hamlet's attitude. Sort of, I mean, classically we say he's sort of teenage angsty, but I think that's a little unfair to Hamlet because it is a difficult situation he's been put in. He's not just a petulant teenager, even though a lot of his behaviors are identical to that. Um, when Hamlet is asked by Claudius, um, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? Why are you so depressed? Hamlet says, not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun, punning on I am your son, and I don't really like that very much. So he's a punter. He likes to grab people's words and immediately turn them around on them. He likes to quote people back at them with a biting wit. He is known for being intelligent. A lot of people think of Hamlet as the most intelligent character in the play, and maybe in all of Western literature. He's very quick-witted, um, very wordy. He likes to talk a little too much. Um, but he's also melancholy, depressed, sad, and grieving. And he doesn't like being forced to glad hand and to be happy with people. Um, so he, like I said, he likes to listen to people and twist and pun their words back at them. Um, his mother you know, is between these two guys and is trying to bring them together. Um, when Hamlet is kind of cold to Claudius, Gertrude steps in and says, good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common. All that lives must die, passing through nature into eternity. She said the word common, and Hamlet grabs it, and he says, and she just means, 
we know that everybody has to die. It's a common thing. But Hamlet takes that word and says, I madam, it is common. When he says common, he sort of says something low class about it. You know, the way people are behaving is a little low class. Gertrude misses that sort of nastiness in his voice and says, if it be so, why seems it so particular with thee? If it's common that everybody loses a father and has to grieve, then why does it seem, she says the word seem, so particular with thee? Why is your grief more excessive? Hamlet grabs that word seems. Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I do not seems. He's like, I don't know why you say the word seems. Maybe some of you just seem sad, but I am sad. It isn't just my inky cloak, good mother. Hamlet loves to say, use the word good sarcastically. He doesn't think mom's being so good here. It isn't my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, um, nor the dejected behavior of the visage, nor the tears in my eyes. None of this can truly denote how sad I am. These indeed seem, other people can wear black and cry, but my grief is real. So he immediately starts twisting her words and sort of critiquing the things she says. Um, so he's kind of like, Hamlet's a prickly pear, kind of a porcupine here. He kind of gets Claudius off and so mom comes in. Now mom feels insulted and walks off, so Claudius comes back in and he makes another long speech. He loves to talk. Um, and you can do this speech in many ways. It can be condescending, patronizing, generous, concerned, critical, judgmental, careful. He basically says, Hamlet, it's, it's sweet and commendable for you to show these morning duties to your father. But you must know, your father lost a father, and that father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. So he kind of tells Hamlet, it's good that you're sad about your father, but you're taking it too far. And if you read the speech carefully, he gets a little more critical and tells him that his grief is irrational and unmanly and offensive to heaven. And you need to stop all this. Um, and it's, you know, he basically says your grief is sinful, stupid, excessive, embarrassing, all those kind of things. And Hamlet listens. He doesn't respond. You should note that it's a long speech because Hamlet just listens without response. Um, and when it's over, you know, uh, basically, Claudius is saying, for your intent in going back to Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire. Like, we don't want you to do that. And we beseech you, bend you, to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier cousin, and our son. We want you to stay here. We don't want you to go back to Germany. Hamlet does not respond. Mom comes in and says, let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. Hamlet has a soft spot for his mother. That's going to be a character trait, that he does love his mother, and that's what makes, it so, makes him so angry with her, is that she's disappointed him. He says, I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Um, and Claudius acts like it's a great thing and sweet and that Hamlet is agreeable. Um, and they leave to go celebrate. Um, but Hamlet does not know, the ghost is going to tell him, spoiler alert, that Claudius is his murderer. And Hamlet kind of falls for Claudius here. The persuasive speech Claudius gives him makes Hamlet soften up a bit, along with the double teaming of his mother. There's a lot of this in the play where there'll be two people on Hamlet's side both of them pressuring him, talking into his ear, and sometimes Hamlet capitulates and sometimes he doesn't. This is kind of his big capitulation in some ways. So um, I just want to emphasize that Gertrude, kind of maybe an underdrawn character, but um, she basically just wants Hamlet to get along with his new daddy. Um, and, and she is intervening every time, trying to smooth things over. Now, one other thing I want to mention that's not in the slideshow is that Claudius also kind of bribed Hamlet a little bit. He says um, that, you know, for let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne. And what he does in front of the whole court is say that, Hamlet, I know you're upset about your father, but you should know that you are the heir. You are the next in line. I call this throwing a bone to Hamlet, trying to get him on the Claudius train. You are the most immediate to our throne and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart to you." Um, and Hamlet, you know, gets that good news, but it doesn't really make him happy. Um, Claudius and Gertrude get Hamlet to agree to stay in Denmark without having to order him. You know, it's sort of like 
uh, uh, with an iron glove and a, and, a, and a of an iron hand and a soft velvet glove. They sort of coerced him into doing it, um, and everybody leaves to go celebrate Claudius's new day in Denmark. And they leave Hamlet alone on stage, and we get soliloquy number one, um, which is suicidal and filled with despair and physical disgust at the world. Hamlet uses interesting images. Garden imagery is important in the play. It reminds us of innocence, the Garden of Eden. Um, and he says that the world is an unweeded garden, that things rank. Hamlet's favorite word is rank, which means rotten and sick. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. Um, we can see that you know, he, he meditates on how different Claudius is from his father. He says that his father was like um, Hyperion, like a sun god. Um, and he talks about his father contrasted with Claudius, who's like a satyr, who's like sort of a god, um, a, a goat man, if you want to look at him that way. And we see that uh, Hamlet's soliloquy is filled with lots of erudite allusions to Greek things, Niobe, Hyperion, Hercules. We can see his brain right away. Um, I want you to look at Claudius's opening speech, which is so in control, and Hamlet's first soliloquy, which is like fragmented and falling apart in every place, where Hamlet's mind is just disjointed, um, and he's often contradicting himself and changing the subject. Claudius is in control, Hamlet's underneath, he's chaotic and disturbed, and the language reflects that. Um, and Hamlet ends his soliloquy by just, you know, mostly hating on his mother for, um, <laughs> for hosting with such dexterity um, to incestuous sheets. How could she move so quickly from crying at my father's funeral to being in my uncle's bed? Um, he realizes that he's the only person who feels this way. Everybody else has a financial investment and personal social investment in Claudius liking them. So everybody's kind of, yes, kissing Claudius's butt a little bit because he's the new king in town. And Hamlet just can't do that. And he realizes that he can't share that. So he says, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. And then Horatio enters. And it's a wonderful scene, right? At first, Hamlet doesn't seem to know them, um, because he kind of doesn't look at them when they walk in. He just doesn't want to interact with anybody. But then he sees his buddy, Horatio, or I do forget myself. Um, and he says, what brings you to uh, Denmark? And Horatio says, uh, a truant disposition, my lord. Which means, I just felt like skipping school. That's what a truant is. Uh, remember we said that Horatio is a nerd, and so Horatio says, um, I mean, Hamlet says, uh, I know you are no truant. Um, I would not hear your worst enemy say that about you. Um, why, why did you come here? Notice that Hamlet is asking him questions because that is Hamlet's nature, curious, intellectual, also personally interested. Tell me really why you came here. And Horatio says, you know, I, uh, I came to see your father's funeral, you know. I, I came because I'm your friend and I wanted to support you. Hamlet, bitter and funny, says, um, I prithee do not mock me for a uh, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. <laughs> which is, which is a, Hamlet's sense of humor is to turn it around, right? Like, you say you came to see my father's funeral, but I actually think you came to see my mother's wedding because they were so closely related, uh, closely related to each other. This is what I sometimes call a Hamlet joke. Only Hamlet can laugh at this. What is, what is Horatio supposed to do? Be like, yeah, you're right. Your mom's a whore. She got married so quick. He can't do that. So, you know, Horatio, politic and po polite. Um, he says, uh, in, indeed, it followed hard upon. Like, yeah, it, it did happen quickly, that wedding after your funeral. Hamlet has another joke. He says, thrift, Horatio, thrift. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. So what he's saying is, in Denmark, we like to you know, save our money, so we wanted to use the same food at one ceremony for another ceremony. This is another Hamlet joke. I mean, nobody can laugh at it but Hamlet because he's the only one who like, is powerful enough to laugh at it. But Horatio uh, um, is you know, loving to Hamlet. Um, and Hamlet sort of talks about, you know, oh my gosh, I just can't get over it. I just see my father in my mind's eye. I just can't get over the memory of him. And Horatio transitions into, you know, I saw your father once. He was a goodly king. He was a man, taken for all in all, says Hamlet. And then Horatio says, you know, I, uh, I think I saw him yesterday. What do you mean? You saw my father? Where? And Horatio explains that they saw the ghost um, on the castle battlements. And Hamlet is intrigued and worried, and he starts peppering Horatio with questions, almost like an interrogation or a lawyer. 
He even throws in fake questions, you know, like, my father's beard was sable, right? Meaning it was all black. Because Hamlet knows that it actually was salt and pepper. It was grizzled. And Horatio answers correctly. You know, he says, no, no, it was grizzled like I saw in life. Hamlet is not trying to trick Horatio. He's just trying to find out the truth because Hamlet is certainly a character who values the truth. Um, so Hamlet gets very excited because he's kind of in stagnant water, miserable and depressed. Um, and then suddenly he hears that there might be something going on that will change the situation from just being like a pet dog who stays in Claudius's court and can't go back to college. Um, so he gets excited. Um, and he says to the, the guards and Horatio to not tell anybody about the ghost and that he'll talk to the ghost tonight. Um, and he ends the, the scene with a rhyme couplet. Um, after the men have exited, he says, foul deeds will rise though all men hide them from the earth's eyes, or something like that. Um, a rhyme couplet is a typical ending of a Shakespeare scene because he had no lights and no curtain, so he gives a sort of sense of finality and everybody knows to clap because the scene is over. So again, the play has momentum. Hamlet is going to talk to the ghost tonight. And so we get excited thinking, oh my goodness, we're gonna see what happens when the ghost speaks to Hamlet. Um, and so uh, we get ready for scene three, which is actually a little different. Um, in this scene, we take a break from the intensity of the royal family's troubles, and we go to the second family in the play, which is the chief minister, of, um, or prime minister of Denmark, Polonius, and he has two children, Laertes and Ophelia. We just saw Laertes is going back to college, so the next scene will be a goodbye scene. Laertes is going to bid farewell to his sister Ophelia, along with Gertrude, the only two female characters in the play and he'll say goodbye to his father. So we kind of get a, a little bit of relief from the intensity of political intrigue, and we get a sort of something personal. So let's go to, uh, meet Polonius and his children.